You got your Mac and Mac guys here on Bird 365. We are joined by Dave Zingaro from NBC Sports Philly, who, like McMullen, was working like a dog the last couple of days. What did you do with yourself yesterday, Dave? Yesterday? Uh, I worked yesterday. Sunday was a, uh, a stay inside, watch TV. It was gross outside, so I just... Yeah, it was. It was gross all... Man, what was that? The one day. Just... Yeah, down. Were, oh, man. man, every time we walked to that auditorium, we were just getting drenched down there. Oh. So Sunday was a good day to just like relax a little bit, not leave the house. A little decompression day. Not yeah. not on top of the undrafted free agents. Uh, that's always an exciting part of, uh, uh, of the process. But Dave, are you the one who gave Howie Roseman a bad grade? Because I, I got a tough time. I was looking. I was trying to uncover every rock. It was pretty impressive. I got to give him credit. Yeah, I mean, you can nitpick here and there with some of the stuff they did, but like overall, it's just I really and it's not even about the players. It's to me, it's about the approach. Yeah, exactly. It's a um, process. the process. I can't grade players. I mean, exactly. But the decisions make sense. That's how I describe. Yeah, it. Does, the decisions make sense. And look, like once you get to day three, who the heck knows, right? Yeah. But yeah. um. The early days, well, heck, even day three, getting Keely Ringo is like, it, it, that's rare for him to do that, right? To trade a future pick like that. But that's a player who we thought was going to go a lot higher than that. And, and the value lined up. And that's the thing. Like, all these Georgia players, he got them later than people expected them to go. Yeah. All yeah. three of them. Yeah. Here's one of my questions, and I know we don't know the answer yet, Dave, so I'm going to ask you to speculate because uh, I've asked how many different people on the show here over the last couple of weeks. Could you pick Sean Desai out of a six-pack? If you (laughs) were given a six-pack of pictures, you're pretty sure you could uh, say, yes, that's the Eagles defensive coordinator because we haven't heard from him yet. Uh, We know that he's the defensive coordinator. They've announced he's a defensive coordinator, but we just haven't had a chance to hear from the Eagles' new defensive coordinator. So we don't know exactly how the Eagles are going to use their defense and or even look at the players within their defense. But if it is similar to last year, a guy like N'Kobe Dean couldn't get on the field. Kaiser White and Edwards were just playing too well, and Jonathan Gannon's attitude was, why should I take them off the field? Why should I punish them? Because we're up by more than two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. And they didn't give much run to their backups last year, like a Nicobe Dean. Do you think it'll be the same again this year? Because they do have a couple of, like a Kaylee Ringo. Where the hell is he going to play? If you've got uh, two starting quarterbacks who are Pro Bowl level players, how the hell is Kaylee Ringo ever going to get on the field? Or will they actually try and develop a first year player this year? as compared to last year? Well, I mean, he's the one – it depends, right? Like, if we're talking defense, he's the guy that – yeah, I mean, he's probably not going to be on the field if if they're healthy. Where is he going to play? I mean, they they have Bradbury, Slay, and Avante Maddox out there. So, um, we'll see. I mean, obviously, last year, health was – amazing and it's it's probably unrealistic to think they're going to be that healthy again across the board next year so uh that <clears throat> that third corner spot is pretty important and it was a spot man by zach mcpherson last year uh i'm curious to see where they use zach this year because i, I thought it was going to be him and greedy uh williams fighting for that third outside corner job but now you have to think okay well you just drafted i know he's a technically a fourth round pick but a really talented player you think is worth developing um, so I wonder how that all shakes out. Uh, look, I move I, him inside, Dave. I've been talking about Pearson. Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking corner. about that. I think he has yeah. that skill set, uh, yeah. and he, he's probably a little. He doesn't have the length necessarily that you'd like outside. So I could see that. Um, it depends, I guess, what they think of Josiah Scott. What Sean Desai thinks of him, but um, yeah, I, it's all of a sudden like they have some decent depth at corner. So I'm curious to see how it shakes out. As far as like Keely Ringo playing. I, I think it's dependent on health and I think it's dependent on circumstance because if they end up in some blowouts, then yeah, they'll probably take Slay out. They'll probably take Bradbury out, but um, barring that and and if they stay healthy, there's probably not a way for him to play early. 
Um, Jalen Carter, on the other hand, I expect him to play a lot. Now, Nolan Smith, uh, probably the fourth man in sort of that edge rotation. They like to come at you in waves, uh, not so much with him. But those third rounders, I think Tyler Steen and Sidney Brown got a chance to play early and, and, and play a lot. Obviously, offensive line, it comes down to can you win the starting job. That's not a rotational position, but... Um, the one thing I look at in this draft and say, they didn't do anything at all ball linebacker. And I start to think to myself, Dave, well, maybe they're going to play big nickel this year. Sean Desai is kind of known for, at least in Chicago was known for it. Um, they called, you know, Sidney Brown, a red star player. They made a big deal of that. That's the first time I've heard that terminology. I don't know about you, but, um, 10 players on the board per year, how he said, you know, intangibles. And they have Terrell Edmonds, who's sort of that box safety. And you start thinking, well, Nicholas Morrow or Terrell Edmonds. Now, there's a lot of time in talent gathering season. They might pick up a real linebacker at some point. Um, what do you think? Big nickel. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if you're asking me, do I want Nicholas Morrow on the field? <laughs> probably not um i i, I do we're, think that they're not killing done, them today yeah i way. think there's a really good chance they're not done at linebacker yeah um that that seems to me like you know last year we we're looking at this team and thinking man they need a safety they need a safety and then they go out and they trade for cj right before the season i could see that being the, the same deal with linebacker though i think they can go find somebody um and i i think they'd probably be trying to fill the the weak side spot i think nicobe's going to be their middle linebacker, and I think he's going to be the guy who stays on the field when they're <clears throat> in five one five. Um, I, I think that just makes sense uh, for him. So I, I I think that there are going to be a lot of packages where you just don't need a ton of linebackers. But it's a tough sell for me, even if you're minimizing that position. They go into a season with Nicholas Morrow, Nicobe Dean. Christian Ellis and Sean Bradley, Davion Taylor, like I, that. Mm. I don't think that's that's good enough for a team that has Super Bowl aspirations. So I, I think that there's a, a really good chance they they still add at that spot. Can I ask a terminology question? Sure. Big nickel. Nickel means an extra defensive back on the field, right? Yeah. Everybody in the league is basically a nickel on every single play. Now, there's no such thing as a nickel anymore. So, and then they, if another DB, you call it a dime. But now we're calling an extra safety on the field, big nickel. Can well, you have a safety. Explain that to me. I, I, the, this I, is I, I, going I, over my head. Maybe I'm too old school yeah. and I don't get it. But how it's, is it's, big nickel the addition of another safety in the lineup? It's a descriptor. It's it's you're you have a safety by trade playing linebacker. So while it Wouldn't is that dime, be a small nickel rather than a big nickel if you're bringing a safety in. No, well you're you're basically saying like it's <laughs> uh like you think of a, a nickel corner, right? Yeah. You think of Avante, you think of like a Josiah Scott. Now well, you have... nickel is usually a smaller guy as a D back. So the uh, the extra lineback, the extra person you're putting on the field is a bigger defensive back as compared to your smaller nickel. That's what makes them big. Well, it, I, I think you're delving too deep. It's just what a descriptor. I'm just trying to understand. I'm, I'm, I'm a man of the people, and not yeah. everybody knows as much football as you do. I mean, technically. And it's confusing me, so I'm trying to help out those of us who are both old school and not as uh, terminology. And technically, by, by what you're thinking, it would be a dime because you would have two extra defensive backs on the right. field. Um, but they use it to describe – the defense more than anything else. And they you come down to big nickel. It's sort of like, well, why do Dave mention or or I mention one of us, Red Star, uh Sidney Brown, the Eagles called him a red star. Well, why do they call him a red star? Because they decided to call him a red star player. Uh and they and they describe they use that descriptor for specific passion players as they described. Um but yeah, I think you're getting to deep in the weeds, but that's what they describe big nickel. Am I right, Dave? Yeah. 
<laughs> now, when you say they, are they the Eagles or are they? Everybody? No, they're not the only ones. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's a term that's pretty prevalent. Yeah, pretty right pre- prevalent around the NFL these days. But let's move on to the offensive side. Let's get away from Big Nickel. Uh, Tyler Steen. Uh, I thought that was an interesting pick uh, for a couple reasons. One, obviously, he played all tackle in, at the college level, um, starting out at Bandy, finishing in Alabama, um, played some right tackle, played some left tackle. Um, but the Eagles announced him as a guard. It's pretty clear they want to move him inside as a guard. You know the history of this team, and you're very close to uh, Brandon Brooks. You guys were in Houston together. They like those big guys inside a guard. And and Isaac is, you know, he was a big guy. And Cam Jurgens, I don't know. I see the listings. They don't look the same to me, Dave, in the locker room. Cam Jurgens, Isaac Sayamalo. Am I reading too much into that they want a little bit more size at right guard than maybe Cam Jurgens can offer? Yeah, I don't think that would be like a disqualifier for Cam necessarily. Um, but I think in, in general, yeah, they want more size. They want like tackle size guards, which is tricky because they want athleticism there too. So if the, those guys – Everyone's like, yeah, just get Jeff Stalin, whoever. But it's like, no, like you can't just, uh, you can't just do that because you need a certain type uh, of athlete, ideally to, to play in this offense. So uh, I think Steen's gonna at least have a shot. I I would still guess that Cam's gonna get the first crack at that right guard spot, and he's gonna have a chance to just run away with it. But uh, and, and I think having a year in the NFL, having a year in the offense, it, it certainly gives him a leg up. But I asked Nick Sirianni if Steen was going to have a chance to compete. And he, he said, I don't want to say that, but he, he said, yeah, the best guy's going to play. And we're like, all right, well, that means it's a competition, right? Yeah, and uh, exactly. yeah, it is. Um, so I think Steen will have a chance to compete, but I, I do think uh, it's Cam's job to lose and we'll see how that shakes out. Yeah. Oh, well, what do you mean issue on the offensive line? Stoutland waves his magic wand and everything works like a charm. I think they, uh, they 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 put too much on his plate. I know he's delivered for him, but sometimes I think it's a bit much for him to transform everything into every player. Well, uh, I mean, it's not like they're. Is. I mean, they they drafted three straight years in the second round at offensive line, so it's yeah. not like they're they're giving him undrafted kids and going make something out of this. Yeah, true. Uh, or in but, the, it's day two, I should say. Uh, we'll we'll see if, but. If we're saying that the uh, Jurgens is more of a guard, uh, is more of a center than a guy who's drafted so certainly as a center, so you're going to ask him to positional change. Um, I think that that that's where where you're selected, the round you're selected, kind of gets pretty much lessened if you're going to ask someone to change his position from what they've been playing pretty much their entire life, and they're for the second straight year doing that with a guy to uh, fill out a guard position for him. But that's just me. Um, running back, DeAndre Swift. Uh, love the acquisition. Take advantage of a team that paints itself into a corner. Be able to add talent. Just throw them all in the backfield at the beginning of the season and made the best man win. They're not tremendously committed to any of them contractually or uh, promise-wise. Do you just uh, say we're, we're going to uh, – See, here's my problem. The Eagles don't practice all that much. Uh, they, they they are a team that has proven sometimes less is more. So when exactly does the competition happen? It sure as hell isn't going to happen in one of the three preseason games, cutting back to that and guys playing against second and third teamers in the second half. How do you decide how you should break out the carries for the Eagles running backs this year if you're the coaching staff? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a rotation no matter how it breaks down. I don't think they're going to have one guy. And they didn't have one guy last year, but they kind of had one guy. You know, Miles was, <clears throat> for the most part, the guy, right? And they, they would they would Gainwell was the third down back. Boston would spell him at times. So Miles was the guy. I don't know if they have the guy. I think they'll ride the hot hand a lot this year. And uh, I'm curious to see how it works out because in terms of production, like Rashad Penny is – the best runner of all these guys, but you can't count on based on his history. You just, you can't go into a season thinking we're going to have Rashad Penny for 17 games. He doesn't do that. So 
Uh, I think he'll, if he's healthy, like he's the guy that will run the ball the most, but um, the rest of them kind of all mix and match. I wouldn't be shocked to see DeAndre Swift end up with the most touches by the end of the year because he's such a good pass catcher. Uh, But I really do think it's going to be a by committee thing. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised to see if injuries dictate a lot of what this rotation ends up being because Penny's had his injury history and, you know, Swift, even though he hasn't had a major one, he's been banged up throughout his career and he, he kind of plays with that style. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I think injuries are going to kind of dictate a lot of this, too. You know, it is interesting to me and you're right, Dave, but I'm, I'm I was trying to think if if, you know, lightning strikes and DeAndre Swift is completely healthy and Rashad Penny is completely healthy, which is a big lightning strike. In in that instance, which one of those guys would get more touches? It's interesting because you say touches. It, it's funny because it's it's that's a tough thing to figure out. The Eagles haven't thrown to their backs. Yeah, they don't. And, when and doesn't dump it off because he takes it himself. That's yep. the thing. It's not yeah. going to be. It's not going to be the checkdowns. It's it, the only time you're going to get it is if you're designing plays that way, whether they're screens or yeah. or wheel routes. Uh, but like they didn't have like DeAndre Swift is such a better pass catcher than anyone they had. Like Miles obviously had that one outlier year as a rookie, but he hasn't done much in the receiving game since then. Kenny Gainwell's fine. Like I, I think he's uh, he's pretty good out of the backfield, but he's not DeAndre Swift level out of the backfield. So now that they have that weapon, does that change it? I mean, do they try to add more screens because they have the offensive line? You think? this should be a good screen team and they just really haven't been. Uh, so I, I think if, if they look at Swift and say, well, he has something our other guys haven't had, we need to kind of get this in the offense. That wouldn't shock me, but you're right about Jalen. Like a lot of times the running backs get the ball in passing situations because the quarterback just checks it down to him. A lot of times Jalen's like, I'll just, I'll run for the same amount of yards. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Uh, so if they're both healthy for the entire season, and I'm not even putting myself – that's, that's not going to happen. I'll say <laughs> – <laughs> I agree. I'm, I'm but, like hemming and hawing about giving this prediction. Was yeah. We just know it's not going to happen. Yeah. I, mean, I think Rashad yeah. Penny is like a, a Pro Bowl running back who isn't on the yeah, field. He is a better – he is a better – he's just – he's an electric runner. He's a great player who yeah. plays eight games a season. So I'll say yeah. Rashad Penny if they're healthy, but I, I think that's a big end. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, uh, staying on the offense, does Zach Pascal need to be replaced? And I'm sure you understand what I mean by that question. He was a type of a wide receiver. Um, the coach loved him, and he really sacrificed and was an outstanding blocker on the outside. When they threw him the ball as infrequently as they did, he made plays. He caught some big passes for him because everyone suspected, all right, well, he's in there to block. Oh, shoot, he's in the pattern. Oh, shoot, maybe we should cover him. Oh, shoot, Jalen threw him the ball and he made the catch. Good on you, Zach. Do they have someone who can do what Zach Pascal did? Will they just not have that as part of their offense going forward? Do you need to replace Zach Pascal in this offense? I don't know if it's like you absolutely have to. Uh, I'm curious to see how it shakes out, though, because you still have Quez – Probably as your number three right now. They didn't replace him in the draft. Alameda. Yeah. Yeah. Alameda is interesting. He's a, but he's also not Zach Pascal. He's a no, little guy. He's not going to block. No. Little speedy guy uh, who you could see pushing Quez a little bit for the slot. But uh, and then after that, you have Brent Covey. He's not going to be your, your, uh, your big body blocking guy. They just brought in the, the Clemson kid as an undrafted free agent. Like maybe he has a shot. Uh, you're right. I mean, they don't have it, but I, I look, Zach Pascal did some nice things in this offense. I'm not going to lose sleep at night worrying yeah. about this offense because they don't have Zach Pascal. Yeah. I think it's a nice luxury to have, but you know, uh, you don't have it. It's not going to kill you. Uh, but it's a, it's a nice luxury to have to, to have a receiver as one of the best blockers in the NFL. And they're probably not going to have that this year. So Maybe they do have to go about things a little bit differently. Um, day three, Dave, I want to uh, talk to you about uh, the quarterback factory uh, going throwback 
bring in the throwback line. I think a lot of people looked at, you know, all right, they brought in Marcus to, to be the backup and he's got, you know, he can run the same offense. And a lot of people made a big deal out of that. They don't want to change the offense. You know, Nick Sirianni loves Phillip Rivers. Uh, he doesn't care. He'll change the offense if he needs to change the offense. Um, this is an old school six foot six pocket pass who can't move. <laughs> the exact opposite of, of Jalen Hurts. Did it surprise you that they went a 180 as a potential developmental quarterback who could be the backup, you know, as soon as 2024? Yeah, it did. It didn't surprise me they drafted a quarterback because that's one <laughs> that's one of their things. Are they're always look at the quarterbacks. I was surprised about the player. Um, to be honest, I didn't love that pick. Uh, but if they do what they did in day one and day two, you go, all right, to take your quarterback in, in round six, or it is what it is. Uh, I was surprised about. Uh, I, I think the offense would have to change significantly. If they ever oh, get they in would. a situation yeah. where Tanner McKee is the backup and Jalen Hurts has to leave the game, yeah, it would yeah. it would it would be a you'd have to change it would be a much different offense, which is doable. I, I don't know, think it's necessarily ideal though. Did you get the sense um, when Gardner was forced to play and Gardner's got some mobility, but they had to change the offense? I those weeks. I sensed a little juice from Nick and Shane Steichen. Uh, they're like, oh, we got a challenge in essence. You know, I, I sensed they got excited by that. Did you sense that? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was it was a challenge for them because they had to kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit and figure out what's going to work for this quarterback. And, and they have it in the back of their minds, right? Like, it's not like, yeah. oh, man, who the heck is this quarterback yeah, yeah, in here? Yeah, yeah. But we've seen that before. I mean, you go back to – 17 and obviously different coaching staff but like but that took some time too you know you remember yeah. what it was oh, like yeah. it was like all right we have a different quarterback let's figure out what works so uh no i i think that especially a guy like nick what he loves to do is the game plan like that's his favorite part of being an offensive coach so when the quarterback changes that becomes a lot more important and uh and shane got excited for it too it wasn't just nick that they, they both did uh, I don't know Brian Johnson well enough to, to know that, but I'm sure he would be excited as a former quarterbacks coach to do the same. All right. I'm going to try this with you, Zangaro. I had trouble with it with John. He just has difficulty divorcing himself from what the Eagles do and the Eagles move and the Eagles think. And it's so ingrained in his thinking. I ask him to give me, well, if you were the general manager, he can't do it. Maybe you can. Howie Roseman is, he quits. He resigns. He moves to Pakistan, whatever. He's no longer the Eagles general Pakistan. manager. They hired Dave Zangaro. And the Chicago Bears call you and say, we'll give you Patrick Queen. Baltimore. On the last year of his contract. Ravens. Uh, what did I say? Chicago. Because um, we're, we're always talking Chicago linebackers with uh, TJ Edwards. The Ravens call you, say, Patrick Queen, we drafted a linebacker. We're ready to move on from him. We love the play. We think he's good. Just a $12 million number going forward for a fifth-year option. We couldn't do that with our salary cap being what it is. We're going to make him available to you. We're going to need a second-round pick in exchange, but we'll give you a fourth-round pick back. And I think the Eagles' second-round pick will be borderline a third-round pick, and the Ravens' fourth-round pick is going to be a great one, but it's not going to be as far down as the Eagles. Patrick Queen, last year of a contract, could do the whole rental thing like Swift, too, that if he goes uh, afterwards, you're going to get a comp compensatory pick anyway. A second, but a fourth in Patrick Queen in return. Putting the Eagles in the way Howie Roseman has evaluated, evaluated uh, linebackers. Should the Eagles do that with the linebacker room they have right now? No, it's too rich. Not He's not pretty damn good player. Not doing it for a second. Yeah, you're getting a one year rental for a second round pick. The fourth round coming back, you know. Um, the yeah, second I mean, round's too rich. Yeah. I'd counter. 
Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I'm not. Yeah, see, the problem with the counter, and I explained this to John earlier, they don't have a third round pick, they don't have a fourth round pick. So you got to give them a second round, but you got to drop down to a fifth. And I think the Ravens go, yeah, that's not enough. Yeah, but that's where I get into my, like how he's very disciplined. I can't divorce myself from that. He's not going to say, I don't have a third round pick. I don't have a fourth round. So I'm going to give a second round. But he's going to do the exact opposite. He's going to be very disciplined. Well, the Ravens are, would probably ask for a second round pick, period. And then, yeah, that's too rich. Well, what, am, what are we going to do to balance the scales? They got to give you something back in return. You can ask for a third just to drop down from a second to a third. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm trying think to get about it like what well, the Eagles got CJ last year for what a four? Yeah, four. Yeah, four plus. Wasn't it two picks? Um, I'd have to look it up. I'd you might be up. right with a seventh. They might have flipped a sure. seventh, um, but it was really late. Yeah, uh, see, I, think was, I think it was a fifth pick. and a sixth. I think I'm pretty sure it's two picks. But I don't even think it was a fourth. I think it was a fifth and a sixth. Okay. Yeah, they got they got CJ for essentially uh, nothing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what you try to do with a guy on the last year of a deal who's not going to re-sign somewhere. They're trying to get something out of him, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, obviously worked out to a tremendous degree with with CJ Gardner Johnson. And uh, hey. I'd like the thought. I think there might be a linebacker out there. So, as Dave mentioned, linebacker might be the position where you have a CJ Gardner Johnson type deal late in camp, or who knows? There might be a post June first cut uh, coming somewhere. But I I don't think they're done at that particular position. So I want to bring it back, Dave, to Howie as a whole. I, <laughs> boy, he. He takes advantage of young general managers. And he, by the way, he does not like to hear this. He does not like when people say, you fleeced, uh, you, you know, not that people say, I saw Kyle Pagan from Crossing Broad at the Super Bowl did it, you know, but they do sort of irreverent stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, uh, you know, but boy, he took advantage of Marty Ozenfort, uh, not knowing the rules. He took advantage of Brad Holmes, pigeonholing himself. Everybody in the league knew, all right, they spent a 12, the 12th 12 pick overall on the running back. They signed David Montgomery. They can't keep Swift. Um, he took advantage. I think he took advantage of Ryan Pulse. Ryan Pulse can't draft Jalen Carter. Can't do it. Can't do it. Does he take advantage of young GMs from your perspective? I think so. But I also like if there's a reason he doesn't want that out there. He yeah, wants to be well. able to keep doing business. Um, I, I do think he's changed a little bit. Like I think he used to really take joy in like winning everything when he was a younger GM. Uh, I don't think he it, it takes as much pride in that maybe as he used to, um, because I think he realizes that the more people talk about him fleecing everyone, the harder it's going to be to get deals done. Uh, there were a lot of like specific examples you just gave there, but it's true. Like he, he finds value where other people don't. It's what makes him a good GM. He's like, he's always had this side of it. Um, it's like the evaluation side of it that he needed to work on. And, um, but I, I look back at like his draft and the trades and everything he did just makes a lot of sense for him. And it's, um, it's impressive that he just, he sees it and he, it really, like it's, it's such a cliche thing, but like, it always feels like he's playing chess and he just has a plan. Whereas like some GMs are fighting for their lives. <laughs> I think that's a big deal. That's a big part of it. Like how he has this job security. He can do. Yeah. His oh, that's a huge, I talk about that all the time. GMs are just yeah. like, you know, they're, they're just fighting to stay above water and he doesn't have to worry about that. Yeah. yeah. Do you think maybe Ryan Poles, felt he owed Howie Roseman one and that's why he gave him the pick because he got a fourth round pick for Robert Quinn uh, <laughs> that he kind of owed Howie yeah. once. Uh, By the uh, way, yeah, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you move up one spot for only a fourth round pick, Howie. By the uh, way, yeah. by the way, this is where Jody and I differ. Like I think Howie's good because all decisions make sense. Like Robert Quinn didn't work out. I still think that decision made sense didn't work out not everything works out from an about like if jalen carter you know is immature 
and he doesn't turn into a player I think he's going to to um, become, and I think he's the most talented player in this draft, Dave. If he doesn't, I'm, I'm not going to say the decision was bad because I think the decision was good, but not everything – Good decisions don't guarantee good outcomes. But the yeah. more good decisions you make, the more likely you're going to have good outcomes. That's how I sort of grade the draft. Yeah, the I, more swings you get, the more likely you are to hit a ball, right? Um, yeah. It, and, like, you can look at all their draft picks and you can find reasons they won't work out. Jalen oh, Carter. Yeah. Uh, Jalen yeah. Carter, why was he there at nine? Because there's character concerns, legitimate character concerns. Uh, Nolan Smith, well, he's 235 pounds. He's an edge rusher. I mean, that's not going to be for everyone. There's a there's a strikeout right there. Um, Tyler Steen, you're asking him to play a different position than he played in college. Sidney Brown, he's stiff. He's a box safety. Like, you go up down the line, there are reasons these picks might not work out, but if two of them do, the upside on all of them is so great. And that, that's, what, uh, that's where the process comes into play. It's because they're – Yes, there's risk involved, but you're trying to take some swings and you're, you're trying to to maximize the output. And the way you do that is by, yes, finding some risk and getting players you think have high ceilings. And that's kind of what they did in this draft. Yeah, that's John and I do separate on this. I, I do put stock into actual results. I don't care how well laid a plan out is, how smart it is, how you can verbally defend it. And then you get the results, and the results outweigh the plan. John, well, sure. All right, Jody, let me ask you about plan. that 2020 draft, right? Two swings at the top of that draft. One of them now in Minnesota. The other one just signed a $255 million contract. So right. when we look back at that 2020 draft, how do you oh, view the it? hit? The hit so far outweighs the miss. It's not even close. So that's, that's absolutely a thumbs up for Howie and or Jeff Flory, depending on what you believe. Jeff Flory uh, was the, the the driving force and Jalen Hurts being drafted. Oh yeah, yeah well, you you, you, you look at them both. Team. If you want to put them together, that's one thing. But if you want to analyze them separately, I'm. Sorry. Well, that's why I say good decisions plural. The more good decisions you make, the more good outcomes you're gonna. If you keep making bad decisions, you might even get a good outcome. Like the kid Chicago picked, who I think they reach for. It might be a good outcome. Darnell, but, right? Yeah. Or not. Uh, uh, yeah. No, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Right. The kid from Tennessee. Dad Skaronsky there is right down the road. He's safe. If you're going to be safe, be safe. Take the safe pick. Um, but they want with upside and all. It might work. Might be a good outcome. But I think they make consistently bad decisions. And, you know, then you're going to have more bad, uh, more bad outcomes. That's why it's plural. You're always going to miss, as you mentioned, the, the Jalen Rager. Nobody stops talking about Jalen Rager. And, and they gave the second round pick $255 million. And they were glad to hand it over. Uh, who cares about Jalen Rager at this point? Um, and, and by the way, revisionist history, if you take Jefferson, they should have taken Jefferson. Would have been a great player here because he's a great player. But they didn't have a high-volume passer at the time. He wouldn't be putting up this historic numbers if he was taken here. Who knows how all this stuff shakes out, but I'm with you. Uh, D. Zangaro, NBCS, follow Dave on Twitter. T tremendous job covering the draft. By the way, I got to send everybody to Dave's Twitter feed right now. He did a who wore it better, James <laughs> Harden walking in to game one in Boston. What a game for James Harden and Dave with his cookie monster outfit. Uh, I assume that was Halloween. I assume it wasn't, uh, you know, yeah, Saturday it was, uh, night. It'd be really weird if it was just like a yeah, Saturday, Saturday night. night. It was just like you sitting around Sunday was your relaxed day. You do have the cookie monster yeah. outfit. Yeah. We yeah. get it, Dave. Who uh, wore Dave it better? Dave, great stuff. Appreciate whenever you come aboard. Thanks much. Uh, we'll be punching you up again uh, before the Eagles get to uh, – are they actually going to have a camp this year? Are we sure? Are they going to meet before the opening day of yeah, camp? Are they yeah. at least going to have a cookout? They're going to uh, have gonna... rookie camp on Friday tentatively, and, uh, you know, they're going to have some OTAs. Very few, but some OTAs. We'll, we'll see exactly how organized those are. Uh, Dave, great stuff. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch. Thanks for jumping in today. Thanks, guys.
Thanks, Dave Zingaro, NBC Sports, Philadelphia here with us on Birds 365. All right, quickie timeout. Come back. Going to put a bow in the show.